The two massive hurricanes this week became the poster child for climate change. This roadway, my God, the, the energy that's coming down this road right now, these wind gusts are remarkable. With just weeks to go before the presidential election, where the candidates stand on climate change. Climate change has become a climate crisis. Every time it turns a little slightly warm, it's global warming, it's global. We'll dig into the differences and what it could mean for future U.S. climate policy. Yeah, the U.S. now is the second largest climate emitter after China, but the largest historically, the largest in history. Today is Friday, October 11th, and this is The Issue from VOA. I'm Scott Walterman. And I'm Lori London. Let me, let me spin around. Stay right there. The cleanup from Hurricanes Milton and Helene continues in the southeastern United States. I never experienced nothing like this in my life. It felt like I was in a movie. I'm very devastated from looking at how my place looked right now. It was very life-threatening. I felt like I was... About to die. President Joe Biden said Milton caused an estimated 50 billion in damage. We're going to uh, we're going to be going to the Congress. We're going to need a lot of help. We're going to need a lot more money. Scientists say the storms were made much stronger and intensified faster because of human-induced climate change due to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we are worsening every year with respect to the warming that's caused by fossil fuel emissions that year on year are still going up. They warn that storms, massive wildfires, and extreme heat conditions around the world will become more dangerous and destructive. The United States has been the number one emitter of greenhouse gases since the industrial age began. In a few weeks, Americans will vote in the presidential election, and the outcome could impact U.S. climate policy dramatically. Every time it turns a little slightly warm, it's global warming, it's global. The planet is going to hell. What about those people that used to say we have 12 years, 12 years, in which case we're all gone? That ended about five years ago. We, we keep waiting. No, the, uh, he said last night, you know, he loves his word. It's an existential threat, existential. For years, we debated the potential impact that climate change could have on our communities, on our country, and our world. And today, we know the impact if folks weren't clear about it before. Just watch the evening news and see that the time for debate is long past. Well, as you can hear, Lori, those are two very different visions. Definitely. Um, it, it's, it couldn't be a more stark contrast. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a big open question as to where we go from here, where this country goes. And when, where the United States goes in this instance, the rest of the world goes, too. Absolutely. Just because well, of the impact we have. The climate doesn't stay in in one country. It's, it's you know, it impacts every person on the planet, really. That's right. Let's talk more about this. Joining us is Lisa Friedman, a reporter for The New York Times, who's been covering climate change for more than 16 years. Thank you so much for joining us and to talk about your latest article um, so you've been covering climate for 16 years, and you've been tracking what uh, Vice President Harris and former President Trump are saying on the campaign trail about uh, their stance on climate. Can you give us big picture where they are? Sure, that's right. And and this piece really was just laying out the stakes um, between the two candidates who are in really different places on this issue. Um, broadly speaking, Kamala Harris has called climate change an urgent threat that needs to be addressed. And former President Trump has uh, mocked the science of climate change and uh, effectively does not see this as a problem that requires a solution. And, you know, as as we've been hearing, uh, we've been seeing these monster storms just this week and, you know, really extreme weather events here and around the world continuing to get worse that scientists say is definitely related to a warming planet, um, greenhouse gases, which means fossil fuels. 
Um, I know that Donald Trump's been big on saying drill, baby, drill, that, you know, climate change, as you said, you know, is, is a hoax. Um, what what sorts of things do you see happening if uh, in a Trump presidency, as, as far as policy goes, he says his policies will be beneficial to the economy? Sure. Um, and all of the candidates have been given multiple opportunities to describe what they would do to address climate change. Um, when asked, uh, Mr. Trump has said some variation on, I, I would bring the cleanest air and water. Um, he does not talk about climate change. Um, and his policies, as laid out on his website and, and from his rallies, would drive up emissions. There, there have been modeling that look at what um, the impact would be, and I'll just name some of them. He has said he would repeal uh, Biden administration regulations on the cars we drive, the factories, the um, uh, power plants, trying to lower emissions from from all of those sources. He has, as you say, said he would drill, baby, drill. And what that means in terms of policy is a blank check for for permits on federal lands and waters. Collectively, uh, you know, one, one group, uh, Carbon Grief out of the UK, added up those policies, and that could translate into 4 billion tons of emissions, the equivalent, quite a number of new cars on the road every year. The Trump campaign is trying to make the pitch in Michigan, for example, that the Biden administration has crippled the car industry because of their push for EVs, electric vehicles. But in but but it's actually the opposite of that, isn't it? I mean, the market is driving sales of EVs and there are new Michigan jobs. That's exactly right. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars are going to uh, Michigan to help build out EVs. Uh, de- you know, demand has taken has taken hits this year, but uh, but there are still new EVs on the road every year because consumers want them. And Kamala Harris, as you said, is calling climate change an existential threat. I know she's she's named some of her policies, and and certainly the Biden administration has definitely focused heavily on the issue of climate change. What uh, what do we know about plans or policies Vice President Harris has talked about? Yeah, Kamala Harris's policies have been a little trickier because she has not been out front about climate change since she became a candidate. We can talk about some of her past positions, certainly, but since she became a candidate, the, the limited things that she has said about what she would do about climate change include continuing the Biden administration subsidies, and that is money, about $370 billion over 10 years that comes from the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, a massive climate law that uh, the president signed in 2022. And secondly, making it easier to build transmission. That, I understand, is pretty wonky for a presidential platform, but it's incredibly important. Right now, there is a ton of money going to wind, solar, geothermal, other energy sources that don't produce carbon emissions. But getting that energy online, getting it from the places that it is created, often in remote rural areas, to transportation centers, uh, is made more difficult by aging and fractured transmission infrastructure that, that needs to be addressed. How she would do it, she's left that unclear. So you're talking about rebuilding the electric infrastructure the way that the, the wires that we drive past that exactly. carry the electricity, because a lot of these windmills are in the middle of nowhere, solar farms in the middle of nowhere. Exactly. I would also point out, though, that, uh, you know, candidate Harris uh, has talked an awful lot about oil and gas in a way that she didn't during, you know, before before she became the presidential candidate. She has said at the, or the debate she held with, with former President Trump, and so has Tim Walz, uh, touted the fact that oil and gas uh, is at record levels, um, production and export, under the Biden administration's watch. The oil industry would 
take issue with with who gets credit for that, but the the fact certainly are that oil and gas development is is hitting record levels. The climate community is not pleased to hear that as a talking point, but I think the thinking is that uh, voters, perhaps in places like Pennsylvania, might be. Hmm. Donald Trump pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Accord. Mm. President Biden brought the U.S. back in. What would it mean for the U.S. global standing if Trump were elected and we pulled back out, given that we are obviously one of the, or if not the biggest, climate emitter? Yeah, the U.S. now is the second largest climate emitter after China, but the largest historically, the largest in history. You know, I was in New York the other week around U.N. General Assembly. Uh, there's an event we colloquially called Climate Week, and uh, there are hundreds of, of policymakers from all over the country. And I spent a lot of time talking to to climate negotiators, to diplomats from small island nations, from Europe and, and Asia and Latin America about just this question. What would it mean if the U.S. pulls out again? And I think it's important to remember that we have a history now. It's not just that President Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement in 2015. The United States, uh, what seems like ages ago, but joined the Kyoto Protocol and then pulled out of that uh, under Bush administration, joined the Paris Agreement, pulled out under under Trump. And so the rest of the world is you know, as I as I listen to the conversations that I've been having, is both ready and exhausted. <laughs> um, <laughs> there is, you know, there's certainly last time it was a surprise um, to somewhat, right? Last time when President Trump was elected, there were actually several months of debate within his administration and the international community really didn't know, you know, maybe he'd stay in, maybe they would do something, something shy of pulling out altogether. This time, there's no question. And one thing that people are ready for is the messaging. When the U.S. pulls out, if, if former President Trump is elected, the rest of the world will be ready with a message that effectively says the rest of the world is moving on with or without the United States. What they're not, I think, prepared for is the real impact of not having the world's second largest emitter, largest in history, largest economy at the lead of a global effort to to change the to, to to affect the energy transition globally. Let's talk about Congress for a minute because it affects both of the candidates actual ability Certainly. to implement what they're saying. One of the things is that Trump says he wants to claw back the Inflation Reduction Act, but there's money flowing into Republican districts. On the same hand, she wants to do things that it's going to be difficult to get through Congress as well. Isn't that the reality and what they're saying a little bit different? I, I think you've hit the nail on the head, and both are hamstrung in different ways. Should former President Trump be elected and work to repeal all or part of the Inflation Reduction Act, there will be resistance among some in his party. A lot of this money, a lot of these investments are going to red states. And not long ago, 18 House Republicans wrote a letter to the House Speaker encouraging him to keep the Inflation Reduction Act investments should Republicans retain the House next year. For Kamala Harris's part, there is not uh, a lot new that can be done without Congress. Um, the Supreme Court recently, in a series of, of rulings, made it more difficult, not impossible, but more difficult for agencies to regulate carbon emissions. There may still be efforts through the Environmental Protection Agency and other agencies to regulate things maybe like steel uh, and, and other industrial facilities, but all of those present real challenges. I want to talk about just about the whole financial aspects of all of this, because sure. the economy always comes into every subject that matters to Americans. Donald Trump says, you know, we need to drill more. We need to drill for oil. It'll be great for the economy. On the other hand, the Democrats, Kamala Harris says clean energy creates jobs and are the way of the future. We are seeing, as this week, these horrible disasters and and they cost a lot of money to 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 get through a lot obviously 
billions in, in repairing and re- recovery, et cetera. So where where does all of this stand as far as which road we take and, and how it will impact the economy? I think that's a great question. There are true elements on both sides. And I think you hit at something that is not talked about often in these economic discussions, which is, you know, we hear a lot about the costs of the energy transition, the costs of uh, reducing fossil fuels. We do not often talk about the costs of climate change and the costs of not addressing climate change. I don't think there are any easy answers, but there, it's certainly true that not taking into account climate impacts in how we build or rebuild costs more down the road. Um, and when regulations, for example, aimed at things like that are repealed, that has a short-term benefit for some industries, but a long-term cost to society. Mm. Lisa, thanks so much for the time. And of course, you can read this article by Lisa Friedman in the New York Times um, and her continuing coverage on the environment at the New York Times uh, online and, of course, um, on the paper. Thanks again so much for the time. Thank Thanks, you so Lisa. much for having me. Thanks, Lisa. Well, that that's an awful lot to think about, Lori, right? Absolutely. I guess we'll have more of an idea not very long from now with the election less than a month away, weeks from now. So stay tuned. This has been The Issue from the Voice of America. On behalf of all of us here at VOA, thanks so much for listening. Follow The Issue on X and Facebook at VOA The Issue. And for news 24-7, go to our website, voanews.com. In Washington, I'm Lori London. And I'm Scott Walter.